Now, I was I was opening the Wall Street Journal, which I, I read the weekend Wall Street Journal. I read it during the week, too, but I particularly love the weekend edition because it's more broad. There's more articles, like, summarizing overall trends. It's not, like, day-to-day -day news as it happens. So I, I noticed that on the op-ed page, on the opinion page, we've got this, this lovely, lovely piece here, Reclaiming History from Howard Zinn. And, and it's an interview with an author, um, author of a new book, and he's talking all about why he doesn't like Howard Zinn, right? And Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States, I must say, is a great, great book. Um, it's a really, really good book. Um, and it's a lot of people's gateway drug to leftism. Um, it's a very, very exciting book. I like Howard Zinn. Uh, the neocons do not, um, you know, um, and, and obviously there's this individual, um, I'm not even going to name him because I don't want to give him the advertising, who's written a new book. He's going to try to counter Howard Zinn. He argues that Howard Zinn has too much, uh, power on the universities, that that narrative is too strong. Um, and, uh, you know, they're trying to, to rebrand U.S. history to be more in line with, with, with the prevailing narrative that the United States is a benevolent power that goes around rescuing oppressed people. Um, I like Howard Zinn. And what I think is interesting is when Howard Zinn died, um, it became public uh, that he had been a member of the Communist Party of the United States at one point. And what's interesting is the year that Howard Zinn joined the Communist Party of the United States was not a time when that was a trendy thing to do. In the late 30s, to join the Communist Party was not a big deal, right? Every, it was in Hollywood, in, in, from like 19, when the Popular Front was going on, what they called the Popular Front, the People's Front Against Fascism, from about 1935 up until about 1939, and even up into the Second World War, up until the end of the Second World, 1945, for about a decade, from 1935 to 1945, joining the Communist Party basically meant you supported the President of the United States because they were in a solid alliance with Roosevelt. Um, and joining the Communist Party of the United States, it was, it meant you were against fascism. You thought that fascism was bad. It meant that you supported labor unions. It meant that you went to a communist club meeting about once a week. It meant that you campaigned for Democrats. Um, but it, it wasn't, you know, you weren't viewed as a, a subversive. You weren't viewed as a traitor. Um, you know, the Communist Party was, was quite powerful during that time. And that, that joining it was not, you know, it wasn't a huge huge deal um, that, that, you know, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, Charlie Chaplin was associated with the Communist Party. He was the most famous actor. Um, you know, uh, Lillian Hellman, a very award-winning playwright, wrote the first play about gay rights, which was ever on Broadway. It's called The Children's Hour. She was a member of the Communist Party. Um, a lot of people joined the Communist Party during the 19, late 1930s, even in the early 40s, because it was, at that point, it was part of the ruling coalition. It was part of the Roosevelt coalition that, that had power um, and they were they were a faction within the Roosevelt government, um, you know, and they had like one guy in Congress. He wasn't actually a member. He was part of the American Labor Party. His name was Vito Marcantonio, but everybody knew he was a Communist Party sympathizer. He was even part of the fraternal organization of the Communist Party, the the uh, called the uh, International Workers Order, and that the Communist Party joining it at that point was. You know, it was kind of a trendy, hip thing to do. And that's why during McCarthyism, all these people got up and apologized because half of Hollywood had been in the Communist Party during, the, during that point because it was a trendy thing to do and you were supporting Roosevelt and you were against the Nazis and, and you were a faction. However, in the 50s, right, after about 1946, when the Cold War got going, when the leadership of the Communist Party was put in federal prison in 1948, when Almost every state in the USA passed a criminal communism or criminal syndicalism law that made it illegal to be a member of the Communist Party. To stay in the Communist Party in the 50s was a big deal. And furthermore, to join the Communist Party in the 1950s was a really big deal, right? Because 24-7, the TV, the newly invented television, the televisions that were all over American homes were telling people... The Communist Party is your enemy. I mean, and and the Communist Party, I mean, it was like associating with them was, was not a trendy thing to do. And it was apparently in 1951, during the middle of all of this, that Howard Zinn, the young Howard Zinn, apparently joined the Communist Party of the United States. And I have a theory, folks, because we all know Howard Zinn's contribution was the People's History of the United States. I have a theory. I think that Howard Zinn was inspired to write The People's History of the United States by this book, The Outline Political History of the Americas, right? This was a book published by the Communist Party of the United States around the time that Howard Zinn was a member. 
Uh, it was published in 1951, the year, I believe, that Howard Zinn joined the Communist Party. And it was William Z. Foster, uh, the, the, the great American Marxist. Uh, it was his attempt to retell the history of the United States of America in a Marxist way. Um, and I encourage you, if you can get your hands on a copy of The Outline Political History of the Americas by William Z. Foster, give it a read. It's a great book. It really is. And it's not just a history of the United States. It's a history of South America, Central America as well. He talks about Cuba. And he, he, he goes up from the, from the time of the first Spanish settlers coming all the way up until the end of the Second World War. Very powerful, giving special attention to socialism and Marxism. But he goes over all the countries. He talks about Peronis. He talks about all kinds of stuff, and, and it's a very good book, but I will say, part of, part of what separates William Z. Foster and this book, this book that was written by the man who built the Communist Party, the man who led the Communist Party when it was powerful, when it was a very effective and powerful organization that had influence over millions of people, even though it only had maybe tens of thousands of members, when this book was published, um, I mean, you know, the man who wrote it, William Z. Foster, the author of this book, right, the way he explains U.S. history and the way Howard Zinn explains U.S. history on the surface might seem the same. They might seem basically the same, right? He's talking about class struggle, he's talking about the rulers versus the people, but there are some key differences, and those differences point to why Howard Zinn's book is available all over college campuses, and this is pretty obscure. For example, Howard Zinn, when it comes to the Civil War, you know, he and his People's History of the United States basically tries to be plague on both your houses, right? That, that Lincoln committed atrocities, yeah, you know, and so did the slave. I mean, he tries to, you know, be neutral kind of in the Civil War. However, William Z. Foster has the Marxist position that Abraham Lincoln... And the second American Revolution was progressive and that the slave system needed to be smashed and that that was a progressive moment. If you read it, uh, William Z. Foster is pointing toward the birth of the Communist Party as a powerful organization that points the way to lead the USA out of all the awful things he describes, like slavery and racism and the slaughter of the indigenous people and, and you know, the suffering and the, the attacks on labor unions. He's pointing toward the Communist Party. He's pointing toward an ideology. Howard Zinn... He builds up this notion of people's movements, right? And he talks about the unemployment councils and the trade unions and all of that. But it's always just the movement that's good. And he spends the book deconstructing. It's all about deconstruction. He deconstructs the myth of the founding fathers, right? The idea that they were all just a bunch of, you know, nice guys who loved democracy while well, they were slaveholders, while well, they had some authoritarian tendencies. He rips apart the myth of Christopher Columbus. He, he deconstructs myths very effectively. And he talks about how popular socialism became. He emphasizes protest movements, but he doesn't push ideology. It's all about deconstruction. He deconstructs the mythology surrounding American history. And that's why all these baby boomer professors think it's amazingly profound, right? That, that what they got spoon-fed in school is disproved by Howard Zinn. But he doesn't replace it with anything. He deconstructs the ideology of the United States of America, but he doesn't replace it with anything. William Z. Foster replaces replaces the American ideology with Marxism-Leninism, right? And with, with the Communist Party line from the 1950s. Howard Zinn does not do that. And so Howard Zinn leaves you feeling, it leads to a place where if you just read Howard Zinn, you know, you can get excited about the movement and the people, I guess. But that, you know, 1960s, there's not a movement now, really. And, and it leads you to this place if there is no truth, there is no hope, you know, and, and in a way, it's not really dangerous to the establishment, right? And that's, that's why Howard Zinn is everywhere and Foster isn't. I do think, though, that, that Zinn, who was a young man in the Communist Party, he was in his 20s when he was in the Communist Party, and he got his hands on, you know, this book. I think something like this, this a text like this probably had a lot to do with inspiring him to write his People's History of the United States. And I think that part of the reason that the left is weak is that it's simply focused on this deconstruction. You can take apart the myths of the United States, that the USA is an infallible country, that it never does anything wrong, goes around the world rescuing people from, from, from dictators, right? I mean, you, you can tell people that, but if you just stop there, all that leads to is demoralization, right? It leads to this, okay, everything, everyone I've been told to worship is a liar. Okay, so the world's full of liars, right? If you don't build up an alternative, if you don't see any rising force of progress, again, like, for example, it, if you look at the U.S. Civil War, 
right? If you see Lincoln as being just as bad as the slaveholders, what side are you going to fight on? Well, you're not going to fight on a side, right? You're just going to sit back and go, oh, the world is an awful place, killing, slavery, Lincoln, Lincoln, southern slave. It leads to a place of demoralization. It leads to... Um, it leads to a place of, of not really taking any action, of just kind of sitting back and being demoralized and hopeless. And that's what a lot of left material does. It deconstructs, but it doesn't construct. It tears things down, but it doesn't build anything up. And that is the problem with a lot of leftist material. And that's why we need to go back and read things like William Z. Foster, right? Read Howard Zinn. I'm not against reading Howard Zinn. A lot of what he says, I, I mean, I, my disagreements with it are largely minor, what I disagree with is what's missing, right? Is that, is that, the, you know, the, he builds up the movement. Movements are great. Movements. And that was always one of my biggest pet peeves. That was the dumbest thing. You know, when I was an active leftist, I was in an organization and they were always talking about the movement, the movement, the movement, the movement, the movement. They're out of touch with reality. The, the number of people that are in the protest cage is very, very small, right? The number of people who attend anti-war rallies and all of that. The broad masses of millions of Americans is who you should be aiming for if you actually want to, to change the country. But this idea of the movement, the movement, the movement, that comes out of the 60s, you know, the movement. And it's interesting because, in fact, movementism is considered to be a deviation of Marxism. Lo and behold, right? Uh, Edward Bernstein, the first revisionist who actually called himself a revisionist, his slogan was, the movement is everything, the goal is nothing. That was his slogan. He said, the movement is everything, the goal is nothing. And I can guarantee you, a lot of people that I knew when I was an activist would agree with that 100%. They always looked at me, Caleb, you're always talking about history and books and ideology and Marx. Oh, but we just love the movement, man. We want to protest and yeah, you know, and only racist white men read books. You're racist and, and you're a nerd and we just love to protest and have fun. Woo, protests and rally, you know. That's Edward Bernstein. The movement is everything, the goal is nothing, right? It's all just about, you know, it's just about being involved in protests and demonstrations. It's not about actually changing the way people think. It's not changing the way people see the world. It's, you know, I mean, that's, you know, anti-intellectualism. That's what Verothius is calling it. That's, that's a good way of putting it, but it's not simply anti-intellectualism. It's, it's a departure, a departure from ideology. You know, it's, it's, it's politics without ideology, right? If it's all about the movement, there's no ideology there. Lenin polemicized against Edward Bernstein, and in his book, What is to be Done, he said, without a revolutionary theory, there is no revolutionary movement, right? That the movement, in and of itself, is nothing, right? You know, the movement is not everything, the movement is nothing. The only reason the movement matters is because it achieves the goal, right? The goal is everything, the movement is nothing, right? That, that if, if, the, if, if the goal is not being achieved, the movement is worthless. And ultimately now, as the 60s left has, you know, died and gotten old, what's left of the movement is basically a wing of the political establishment, right? The stop Trump mobs that are promoted on CNN are not going to lead to socialism. They're not going to lead to socialism. They're, from a, they're led by a wing of the ruling class that wants to control Donald Trump because they fear he's a populist. That's really all that's there. And so to be a movementist, to be a movementist in the 60s made sense. To be a movementist in the 80s made sense. To be a movementist in the 90s, even during the Bush years, to be a movementist made sense. To be a movementist now makes absolutely no sense. The movement, what people call the movement, right? Those group of people who go to liberal rallies, that fringe of the Democratic Party, liberal activists, people who go to protests who are Democratic Party liberals, they are more pro-war than average Americans are. Let me repeat that. Polls have come out and showed that average Americans are more against wars than active rank and file Democratic Party and liberal activists are. You go to I go to these rallies, right? I, I have a job. I I go to these rallies and interview people. I don't participate. I'm not an activist, but I go and do media coverage of these rallies. Go to a Stop Trump rally and ask people there what they think about North Korea. You'll have pictures, pro protest signs with. Trump's face next to Kim Jong-il. Trump's face next to Putin. Their grievance against Trump is that he's not warlike enough. They will have Trump with a big hammer and sickle behind him, right? Trump is a communist, right? I mean, it's, you know, the people that are more critical of the system tend to be, you know, the more on the right, you know, and, and that's as weird as it is. Their ideology and their worldview is completely wrong, but they tend to be more critical of the system than, than folks on the left. The, the, the rank-and-file Democrat 
the movement is more more in line with the ideology of the ruling class than than conservatives are, and then the, the broad masses of people are. Your average person, your average person who's not politically active, thinks the wars are 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 lies. They don't trust the government. Your average rank and file Democrat thinks Putin is threatening our democracy, and Maduro is a dictator, and and that's what the. I mean, I'm I'm telling you, folks, that's how the movement thinks. The movement, the movement is not. Is it, at one point the movement was a progressive, a section of U.S. society that was more progressive than the rest. Now the movement is a section of U.S. society that is being mobilized to defend the establishment as average people start to wake up. So being a movementist at this point is the, is 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 a hundred and eighty degrees away from where you need to be, right? I mean. The inundation says the left movement these days are McCarthyists. Yes, exactly. Right. The movement at this point is about keeping U.S. society in line, um, and and to to be a movementist in this day and age is just wrong. And if you read Howard Zinn's writings, it leads you to the conclusion that the movement is everything. It's all about the movement. It's not all about the movement. The movement is nothing. The goal is everything. 